Hi, I'm Don from Don Drones On. I've been human pretty much all my life, and yet I still struggled with some of the questions on the Canadian ARPAS regulations pilot exams, both the basic and the advanced, in the human factors section. Now, why would that be? Well, one reason is that many of the questions are based on these two books, Human Factors for Aviation, Basic and Advanced, and these books are difficult to get hold of and aren't available in soft copy format. So I got myself a, a copy, read through it, and I'm sharing some of the key wisdom from these books. Anyways, let's have a look through this. So I'll be covering the following topics in this video. What is human factors? What are the knowledge requirements for RPAS or, or drone pilots? And the key facts from those requirements in each of the five areas, aviation physiology, the pilot and the operating environment, aviation psychology, pilot equipment materials relationship, and interpersonal relations. The material that I'll be presenting is absolutely critical for you to know in order to get through the human factors section of your drone exam. 99% of the material I'll be, be presenting is from these two books published by Transport Canada, Human Factors for Aviation Basic Handbook and the Advanced Handbook. I do want to emphasize that these books are oriented towards manned aircraft pilots and as such, you might find it very strange that you're required as a drone pilot to understand things like hypoxia and how to communicate with air traffic control and things like this. But trust me, you will see questions on the exam from this material and uh, so you're expected to know it. So what is human factors? Human factors is the study of how people interact with their environment. This is the definition from the book. And in particular, from an aviation perspective, this is how a pilot's performance is influenced by things like the design of cockpits, temperature and altitude, the functions of the organs of the body, particularly your eyes and ears, and the effects of the emotions on the pilot's performance, and the interaction and communications with others. I'm going to put this up here now because uh, it, it is really the foundation of both of those books. It's basically stating that the cornerstone of safe flying is awareness and not just awareness of what's going on with your aircraft, but more so the awareness of how you function as a person, as a human being, physically, intellectually, and emotionally, how your diet and moods can affect your ability to fly safely, how to get the most out of people in the aviation system, strangely, that's, that's in the book, how your mind frequently plays unintentional tricks on you, perception issues, and of course, how alcohol, hypoxia, and fatigue can sneak up on you. From a drone perspective, the ARPAS knowledge requirements specify all of these five sections for areas that you must know as a drone pilot. These are all taken from TP15263 knowledge requirements for drones. And uh, so don't try to read all this here. I'm going to cover each of these in a section unto itself. So five specific sections. And you'll see these icons in the corner of each of the pages to help you kind of navigate as you go through. And I do want to remind you at this point that this slide deck of about 35 or so slides PowerPoint slides is available as a soft copy file uh, for a nominal fee. You can see the link and how to purchase this material in the description below the video. And um, you might find it very, very helpful to have this material on hand when you're doing your exam so that you can refer to it immediately. The first section is aviation physiology. Here are the knowledge requirements for that section. So, and, and I want to point out that all of, for all of these sections, all of the material is required for both the small basic operation exam and the small advanced operation exam. So the topics are vision and visual scanning techniques, hearing, orientation and disorientation, including various illusions, body rhythms and jet lag, 
sleep fatigue and fatigue anesthetics and in particular they emphasize that the drone drone pilot which they keep saying is the small arp as pilot operating within visual line of sight must be able to describe good scanning techniques visual and audio for visual observers describe what's what is uh, known as perspective illusion when looking at distant aircraft and describe factors that affect alertness when i'm going through this material i'll be focusing mostly on these items at the bottom of the uh, knowledge requirements and touching on some key topics out of out of these the first area that pertains to vision is blind spots and your eyes have actually two forms of blind spots in daylight we have small blind spots in each eye where the optic nerve which is this little black line here connects to the eye and at that point there are no um, nerve endings in the retina and so there is actually masking of your vision when um, uh, an image hits that hits that spot on your retina so the recommendation is in daylight avoid fixating on single points keep moving your eyes around basically to minimize the impact of these blind spots because as long as your eyes are moving that blind spot kind of moves around and you you won't be impacted as much at night when your your eyes are adapted to the to uh, darker darker skies we have larger blind spots in each of the eyes and they're at the point of the eye called the fovea and the fovea is where in the daytime most of our uh, vision is actually seen this is the point of best visual acuity during the day so strangely enough where you can see the best in the daytime is where you see the worst at night and so the recommendation is at night look a little ways away just slightly away 10 to 15 degrees I think from up from the point of interest to see it actually better the effects of red light can pop up on your exam now red light is helpful to retain your night vision and you often see uh, people in submarines running around with red lights so that when they surface at night they uh, they instantly have their night vision so that's all well and good but objects that are illuminated by red light such as maps and charts and checklists and things like that that you as a drone pilot might want to see will appear out of focus and be indistinct that's not good so in fact the recommended method to view maps or written material at night is actually to close one eye that way that eye retains its night adaptation and use a white low intensity flashlight or other light source uh, on the written material visual scanning techniques another key topic now this particular one is one of only a couple that are not actually found in these human factors books I mentioned and the source for this is a website I found called dronepilotgroundschool.com and on that website it recommends it that visual observers uh, scan as follows so you begin your scan and you can see here a couple of guys one of them presumably is the visual observer there's the drone up there they recommend that you begin your scan by looking at the 12 o'clock position high in the sky above the drone scan from left to right from the nine o'clock position to the three o'clock position being sure to cover the same points or airspace that the pilot in command is currently flying in so cover the airspace where the drone is and then pass back again from the three o'clock to the nine o'clock and if necessary go repeat that down and then go back up to the top and repeat that cycle as a systematic way to cover the airspace some additional scanning tips are to frequently focus on distant objects to avoid the empty field myopia and what this means is if you're staring at a at the empty sky your eyes will tend to focus on a point relatively close three to five feet away if they're not stimulated so try to focus on distant objects even if it's the drone or a tree that's a little ways away and that will help you to stay focused in the in the distant uh, yeah, areas and in low light conditions as I said before look slightly away from the target object to avoid the visual blind spot and in addition to 
uh, to, to using your eyes, use your ears to listen for approaching aircraft or other hazards. Look for them and convey that information to the pilot in command. Perspective illusion is one of the specific requirements of the human factors area. Perspective illusion is the way a distant object looks smaller than when the same object is closer to you. I'm sure you're very familiar with this. The reason this is, is important is in two specific areas. If an aircraft is approaching you head on, as represented by these diagrams, the aircraft itself might appear absolutely motionless in the sky if it's heading straight at you. And unless you notice that its dimensions are gradually increasing, you might not understand that it's approaching you uh, as opposed to maybe you think that it's, it's um, going away from you. And similarly, if an aircraft is passing um, across from say left to right and only gradually approaching you, so it's sort of on a converging trajectory to where your, your drone or aircraft is, then it might be difficult to tell that that aircraft is, is, a, is basically approaching you unless you pay particular attention to the aircraft's size. So that's what perspective illusion is all about. Fatigue is the next topic area. There are two types of fatigue. Acute fatigue, which is short term, and that's caused by recent loss of sleep or intense mental or physical activity over a relatively short period of time. Chronic fatigue, on the other hand, is cumulative, resulting from many episodes of acute fatigue, along with other factors potentially, such as stress or jet lag. There are many different causes of fatigue, and these can lead to lack of alertness, which is a requirement for you to know about on the exam. These include lack of restful sleep, dehydration, due to not drinking enough, surprisingly, caffeine, since it induces tension and can lead to dehydration, noise and vibration, illness, certain types of medication, hypoglycemia, low blood sugar, hypoxia, which is inadequate oxygen, and we'll talk a lot more about that, uh, impaired vision, which is could be caused by incorrect eyeglasses or contact lenses, extremes of temperature, hot or cold, boredom, including listening to me read this list, jet lag, or unresolved stress. The second section of the human factors requirements talks about the pilot and the operating environment. So this includes medications, substance abuse such as alcohol, heat and cold, noise, and toxic hazards. And specifically, the drone operator must be able to describe the effects of a hangover on pilot performance, describe the effects of the exposure to cold and excessive heat, on pilot performance and the symptoms of carbon monoxide poisoning. The effects of alcohol. Clearly alcohol and, and other drugs can lead to negative impact on thinking and decision making. It impairs visual, auditory and vestibular or balance systems. It has a negative impact on short and long-term memory. It slows reflexes and disrupts coordinated movement. It makes you more uninhibited and reckless and it can cloud judgment. There are even some side effects of common drugs that can have a pretty significant effect on you as a drone pilot. Some of these are good and some of them are not. You should be aware of it. Again, the theme of awareness is important to understand. This again is from the Human Factors for Aviation books, but even they say that it was adapted from another reference, Dr. Richard Reinhardt's book called Fit to Fly. Let's walk through these. Caffeine. Yes, it's a stimulant, but it's also a diuretic and it can induce anxiety. Aspirin. Sure, it's a painkiller and reduces fever and has anti-inflammatory effects, but it can also cause ringing in the ears and gastritis, and it may be masking a real problem. Similarly, acetaminophen, while it's a painkiller and reduces fever, it may be masking a real problem that could come to, the sur come to the surface while you're piloting your drone. Ephedrine and phenylephrine, sorry, I'm not very good at pronouncing these, are decongestants, decongestants, but they are also stimulants, which can leave you a little bit with the shakes, perhaps. Chlorphenyramine, 
which is an antihistamine, has an antihistamine effect, obviously, but it is also a sedative and a drying agent. It can induce vertigo, can cause blurred vision and increase your heart rate and decrease coordination. And lastly, phenylpropanolamine, wow, made it through that, uh, is a decongestant, but it is also a strong stimulant, can be a diet suppressant, it can increase blood sugar, and can increase blood pressure. Environmental impacts. Three things that they ask us to be aware of. Extreme noise, heat, and cold. So extreme noise can be a fatigue and stress factor. It can hamper communications amongst your, your crew members, particularly visual observers, and in the long term can lead to hearing damage. Extreme heat can be dehydrating and of course lead to heat exhaustion, particularly if you're subjected to heat over 30 degrees Celsius for an extended period of time. And extreme cold can lead to drowsiness and inability to concentrate and can also lead to a loss of muscular control. Here's my favorite, hypoxia. Hypoxia is when our bodies do not receive sufficient oxygen. And the impact of that is a number of very strange symptoms. Confusion, strangely euphoria, but it can also lead to dizziness, nausea, headache, and loss of motor skill coordination. Now there's two different very specific types of hypoxia. There's hypoxic hypoxia and anemic hypoxia. Uh, the simplest way to remember this is hypoxic is from being high, on a mountain that is. And how it occurs is when there is a deficiency of oxygen in the lungs. This is most commonly caused, as I said, extreme altitude. And for most people, this becomes an issue only over 10,000 feet above sea level for most people. However, if you are a smoker or have a lung disease or disability, you can be impacted at lower altitudes. We'll talk about that on the next slide, in fact. Anemic hypoxia is quite different, however. This is when there is certainly enough oxygen being presented to the lungs, but the blood cannot sufficiently carry that oxygen to the rest of the body. The most common cause of this is carbon monoxide poisoning. Carbon monoxide poisoning or carbon monoxide comes from engine emissions or even tobacco smoke and can be absorbed into the blood instead of the oxygen. So the oxygen can't get in there and hence be carried through the rest of your body. This same effect, anemic hypoxia, can occur due to anemia or having recently donated blood. With hypoxia, there is a notion called time of useful consciousness, or PUC. Time of useful consciousness, consciousness is the most common measure of the effects of hypoxia. Smoking can impact PUC. A smoker at 5,000 feet above sea level can equate or have the same PUC as a non-smoker at twice the altitude, at 10,000 feet. Your time of useful consciousness at around 10,000 feet can be measured in hours, so not a big impact, really. At 20,000 feet, though, your time of useful consciousness is reduced to a few minutes, 30,000 feet to about a minute only, 40,000 feet and you're down to the 30-second range, and when you're above 45,000 feet, you have only a few seconds before losing consciousness from lack of oxygen. The next section you need to be aware of is aviation psychology. The knowledge requirements here include factors that influence decision making, situational awareness, stress, managing risk, attitudes, workload, and attention, workload attention and information processing. The drone operator must be able to list factors that interfere with effective decision making, list the factors that affect situational awareness, and describe how a given operational risk might be managed. Decision making in aviation involves three key steps. The first one is situational awareness, and from an aviation perspective, this means recognizing that something needs your attention, 
In other words, some decision needs to be made based on your knowledge and your vigilance. In other words, paying attention. Number two is uh, this, the second step is evaluating your options. So you need to diagnose the problem, generate solutions, either on your own or with your team, and assess risks associated with those solutions. Anticipating potential problems in advance allows you to work through these problems without the immediacy of danger. And this is a huge advantage when you're evaluating options, if you've already thought about them before you even took off, then you're not under the pressure of time to figure out what you, you should do at, the, at that moment. The third step in the decision-making process is to choose from the options. You apply your judgment to choose the best solution from amongst the options. And you may need to revisit those decisions from time to time as the situation progresses and as different factors either come to light or different things happen. So it could be a cyclical process, but fundamentally in every case you're going through those three specific steps. There are several factors that affect good decision making. The first one is lack of vigilance. If you are not paying attention and are not even aware of an issue that requires a decision, you're not likely to make a good decision because you'll have less time to think about it. Distractions can be a major factor when making decisions. Peer pressure can be a factor when making decisions because they're your peers, whether that be uh, your friends or family, could be pressuring you to get that perfect picture or uh, uh, pass under that, uh, under that bridge or whatever. So these can affect good decision making. Pressure from management if you're being paid to do your particular drone job and uh, they are expecting you to get the, the ideal survey of the land or whatever it is your mission is uh, in one day and you can't do it in one day and so you, you're flying when you're tired, as an example. Insufficient or incorrect knowledge can obviously make uh, change a good decision into a bad one. Unawareness of the consequences, so not thinking about what the consequences of your decisions are, ignoring those consequences, and last but not least, overconfidence. Overconfidence can lead you to take risks that you might not otherwise take. I mentioned situational awareness earlier, and here's a definition. Situational awareness is having all the knowledge that is accessible and can be integrated into a coherent picture when required to assess and cope with a situation. So it's really having a, having really thought about and understanding everything that's going on to the best of your ability. The key factors for situational awareness are to accurately perceive the elements of the situation from instruments, visual or audio cues, and communications with your crew. And accurately is the key word here. So understanding that there could be illusions and things like that going on and your communications with your um, crew members might not be perfect. So the key thing is accurate perception. Number two is applying your experience and your knowledge to integrate that information into a coherent uh, picture in your mind. And number three projecting the information into the future to make plans and to anticipate problems. Managing risks. While that's not always possible, the best way to manage a risk is to avoid it entirely. And the best way to avoid a risk is by thorough pre-flight checks and site surveys. Take actions on items in advance of them becoming a problem. Gather information from multiple sources, so for example, if you're not sure about your weather uh, forecast for the time of your flight, get your weather forecast from multiple forecasting sources and make your decision based on that. And as often as possible, make decisions ahead of time rather than waiting for a risk to realize itself on top of you. For example, land your drone before a storm hits as opposed to waiting to the last second. Be sure to pre-flight check yourself and there's a little checklist on the next page that I'll walk through. And when making your plans and uh, your, your missions, 
identify contingencies or what you might call an out in advance. So if you're worried about uh, the wind, you can't tell what the wind is at a higher altitude, think about that in advance and have a contingency in mind. If I get above a certain altitude and it appears as though the drone is struggling with the wind, I'm going to drop down to a lower altitude and take my pictures or whatever from a lower altitude. And the key phrase from the book is, if you're not sure what to do, do the safest thing. Here's a great idea, a pre-flight check for yourself. And again, I'm going to emphasize that this checklist, which is straight from the book, is targeted towards uh, manned aircraft flyers. So you'll, you'll see some curiosities in here. So it's called I'm safe. And it's one of these checklists where each letter represents an item on the checklist. So I is for illness. Do I have any symptoms? M is for medication. Have I been taking prescription or over-the-counter drugs? S is for stress. Am I under psychological pressure from the job? Do I have money, health, or family problems? A is for alcohol. Have I had anything to drink in the last 24 hours? Now for drone uh, regulations purposes, that's 12 hours, but I think they're emphasizing 24 hours as a recommendation as opposed to a regulation. Um, do I have a hangover? F is for fatigue. How much time since my last flight? Did I sleep well last night and am I adequately rested? And finally, E is for eating. Have I missed eating enough of the proper foods to keep me adequately nourished during the entire flight? If you answer yes to any of these questions, reevaluate your decision to fly. The next section is number four, pilot equipment materials relationship. And here are the knowledge requirements for this section. Understanding controls and displays and errors in interpretation and control, standard operating procedures, correct use of checklists and manuals, and the impact of automation and potential complacency. The drone operator must be able to explain the benefits of standard operating procedures and lessons learned, and how to manage an interruption to a checklist. So I'm going to focus on these ones. What's a standard operating procedure? Well, the definition of this is a written, uh, written instructions that personnel are meant to follow to ensure safe operations. The benefits of standard operating procedures are as follows. They provide a logical order or a sequence of steps that are more repeatable. Number two is they improve communication because they, uh, if everyone knows the standard operating procedure, everyone's using the same phraseology or terms. Number three is it improves the margin of safety because it defines safety limits. Number four is it improves workload management across your team because the standard operating procedures will divide the work up across the crew. Number five is it prioritizes duties. So it defines which items are more important. So which ones to spend the most time on. Number six is that standard operating procedures provide enhanced situational awareness because it's easier to anticipate what another person in another aircraft, for example, will do. Number seven is that it improves cross-checking between crew members. So if you know that your visual observer is supposed to be doing such and such, you can cross-check with them to make sure that they're actually doing that if they seem to be wandering off and checking their phone, for example. Number eight is setting limits uh, amongst your crew. So this is defining safety limits. Number nine is an interesting one. It's called, uh, titled teamwork, but what this really means is that standard operating procedures enable team members to exchange tasks more easily. So if your visual observer is sick, but you have another visual observer who is pro uh, proficient at your standard operating procedure, you can call them up and they'll be able to walk right in and, uh, and blend into the team perfectly. Or you can have people switch jobs if, uh, I don't know, say their eyes are sore or something like this. Um, number 10 is conflict resolution. Because the standard operating procedure is a standard, it does form the basis for 
at least for this operation, what is the right thing to do. Lessons learned. So take the time after an incident, like this one, to determine the root cause or root causes and what changes in behavior or procedure would have prevented it. And when you do identify what those root causes are, take specific action on the preventive measures that you have identified. A major form of a lessons learned experience is a formal aviation safety investigation. And in the AIM document, in the general section, section 3.1, it specifically says that the purpose of an aviation safety investigation into an aircraft accident or incident is to prevent recurrence. It is not to determine or apportion blame or liability. Checklists. Checklists are memory aids to ensure that critical items are not overlooked, particularly in times of stress and fatigue. Checklists help to promote consistency in your operation and thoroughness. Now, when you're using checklists, there are some issues that can occur. The most common one are these three. So number one is fatigue and stress. Items can be overlooked or incorrectly confirmed. This requires discipline and diligence to prevent this. Number two is interruptions. Standard operating procedure should be to not allow the crew to be interrupted during a checklist. Now, if you do happen to be interrupted while you're going through a checklist, the recommendation is to keep the checklist right in your hand or in a very prominent spot if you are interrupted so that you know hang on, I haven't finished going through the checklist yet. So keep it in your hand and that might help you to remember to continue on with that checklist. But really you should not be interrupted during a checklist. The last uh, or the third most common issue during a checklist uh, operation is time pressure. And this can mean that you, you might have the tendency to rush or skip items if there's time pressure. And given how important checklists are, as memory aids, particularly when you're tired or, or under stress, the key thing to remember is that discipline is critical in completing your checklists effectively. Automation. Now, it's interesting in our day and age to talk about automation in a negative way, um, but it, again, the, these books were written from the perspective that automation can fail you and you must be aware of that and you must not uh, become over-reliant on computers or um, autopilots or even things like return to home uh, features in your drone. So what they're saying here is that automation can lead to cost savings for sure in the case of manned aircraft uh, because it can reduce the number of flight crew members required to keep your, your plane in the air. And it can change workloads, but it does not actually reduce workload according to the book. It can change the risks that you might be um, facing in your flight because it can actually encourage pilots to fly in marginal weather conditions, as an example, due to over-reliance on, uh, on radar or, or other instruments. And strangely enough, one of the documented effects of automation is to actually increase the pilot's mental workload. I know this is completely counterintuitive, but this is what the book says, and it quotes some studies saying that the effects of automation is to increase the mental workload. And why would that be? It's because it, uh, automation requires more attention and monitoring to keep track of what is happening, to keep that situational awareness. The next impact is that it, uh, automation can increase the time with where the pilot has they're what is called head in the cockpit instead of looking out the window and watching for, for hazards. So increased time with head in the cockpit, dealing with computers can reduce your situational awareness. And last but not least, automation can lead to complacency and over-reliance, which can in turn lead to errors. The overarching statement that is in the book is that all pilots must be wary of any inducement, automated or otherwise, or automatic or otherwise, 
to forsake established airmanship skills. In other words, you should be able to fly your drone, for example, uh, in ADDIE mode as opposed to GPS mode in case that uh, automation fails you. You should be able to tell which direction your, your drone is facing even without looking at the cameras because if your camera fails on your FPV device, uh, you, you might have a lot of difficulty figuring out which, which way to fly. So be aware of that and be prepared in case those automated systems fail you so that you can fly safely and return to home safely. The last section in the Human Factors Knowledge Requirements is in interpersonal relations. This is communications with flight crew, air traffic services, customers, public and authorities. It covers operating pressures from your peers or family and operating pressures from your employer. And the drone operator must be able to resolve differences peacefully, promote open communications, and place safety requirements over hierarchy or position in organization or other political situations. The book outlines five key areas for effective crew communications. And I do want to emphasize these are crew communications techniques. You might not want to try all of these with your significant other. So number one, seeking information. They emphasize that if you are not sure about something, if you want to understand something, ask questions. Don't be afraid to ask questions. Don't be inhibited to ask questions. Don't feel dumb um, because you're asking a question. Just ask the question. If you're not sure if that thing in the sky is an airplane or a bird, say, I see something in the sky. I don't know what it is. Do you know what it is? To the other person, perhaps, in your crew. Number two, stating one's position. And this is peculiar, but here it is. You should not be afraid to state your viewpoint continually until it no longer seems at issue. So, for example, if you think that the wind is too strong and you're a visual observer, you might say to your pilot in command, I think the wind is picking up and it is no longer safe to fly. If your pilot ignores you, you should emphasize it again. Don't be shy. State it again and again until the pilot well, probably punches you, or till they acknowledge that they understand the issue and they either uh, land, the, land the drone or take appropriate action for the wind. Number three, and it's odd that it's number three because in every communications course I've ever taken, listening is number one, but here it is at number three, practice active listening, avoid interrupting the other person who's, who's speaking, avoid diverting the conversation to irrelevant topics, and avoid debating. Listen, try to understand what they're, what they're saying to you. Number four, resolving differences. There's always going to be, at one time or another, a difference of opinion or a different, uh, uh, of difference of perception of an issue or whatever. It is important to resolve these differences by, number one, acknowledging that they're, they are different. And number five, providing feedback. It is great in, in terms of crew communications to provide constructive feedback, um, even upwards in quotation marks to the pilot in command, um, because everyone needs feedback. And I think that, will, that kind of thing can lead to more effective crew communications down the road. So those are the five in the order that the Transport Canada book suggests, with number one being seek information. Because there will always be from time to time differences of opinion or perception, it's important to be able to resolve these peacefully. So listen to all opinions and recommendations. Keep the discussion to the issue. So you know, the old catchphrase is be tough on the problem, not the people. Not like in the picture here. Um, bring out the differences, recognize them, uh, and, and recognize areas of agreement as well. You might find that you agree on five things and disagree on one, and that sort of bringing out of the areas of agreement and disagreement can help to uh, minimize the, I'll say, the personal impact of a disagreement. Acknowledge feelings and emotions, and build respect by considering everyone's opinion. 
Don't just ignore them because they're the new person on the block or a new person on your crew. Um, their opinion is important, they may be learning, and they may have a fresh set of eyes and may have spotted an issue that you really do need to take, take uh, into account. Peer pressure versus safety. When dealing with peer pressure, you need to be able to set personal limits for behavior such as drinking or other unsafe practices. You need to avoid showing off because that usually means taking unnecessary risks. And sometimes you'll be dealing with pressure from your employer to take risks, such as uh, performing your mission today, even though the conditions are not uh, appropriate for flying. So how to deal with that? You need to communicate your concerns to your employer. You need to consider offering alternatives. I'll go back on the weekend and take uh, those pictures for you, for example. And you need to remember that the Canadian Workplace Safety Code applies to drone flying too. Just because you're standing out in a field doesn't mean that these workplace safety codes don't apply. And that code says you have the right to know, the right to participate, and the right to refuse dangerous work. And I'd like to end on this page. The cornerstone of safe flying, whether that be a manned aircraft or a drone, is awareness. It's awareness of how you as a human being operate. It's how uh, awareness of how things like your diet and moods can affect your ability to fly safely, how you can work effectively with your crew members, how your mind can play tricks on you, and how alcohol, hypoxia, and fatigue can sneak up on you. There you go, some of the key elements from Human Factors for Aviation. I hope you found this useful and interesting, and good luck with your exam.